Hola from Mexico City. Hello back. Thanks for joining. Um, we're just going to give it one more minute here while people are continuing to log in. Thank you so much for attending. And hello from Weatherford, Texas. Hello from Chicago, Illinois. Thanks again for joining. Give it one more second here. All right, we're gonna get started. Hello and welcome everyone to Minding Your Memory Challenges and Training Techniques presented by Dr. Linda Ircoli and moderated by Belmont Village's founder and CEO, Patricia Will. Today, we will be exploring how our memory changes as we age and cognitive training techniques to help us stay sharp. Um, a couple of housekeeping items for today's presentation. First thing, we are recording. So after the presentation, you will receive in about a week a uh, recording of the presentation in your email. You always can turn to our Belmont Village webinar page on our website to see the library of other presentations we've done as well. As an attendee today, your audio and your video will be off, um, but we'd love to hear from you. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A box specifically. It's on the bottom. Uh, menu of your Zoom. And after the presentations, questions will be answered from the Q&A box um, moderated by Patricia. And after the question and answer session, we will dive in to learn a little bit more about Belmont Village and we hope that you'll stay to participate. Um, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Patricia Will. Uh, Patricia co-founded Belmont Village in 1997. And today the company is known for built the purpose development, best in class hospitality, first-rate care, and unique partnerships with top universities and institutions. Belmont Village serves thousands of residents across 32 communities in eight states and Mexico City. And Patricia is amazing. She's been inducted into the American Senior Housing Association Senior Living Hall of Fame, the Texas Business Hall of Fame. And, um, you know, she's an adult daughter of uh, one of our Belmont re residents herself. So it's near and dear to her heart, in addition to her being a leading expert in senior housing um, and pioneer, pioneering senior uh, care for folks with memory loss and dementia. With no further ado, I turn it over to Patricia. Well, thank you, Lauren, and thank you all for being here today to hear one of uh, the best uh, speakers and researchers in the industry on how to maintain your brain. For the last few years, I've had the privilege of serving on the board of the UCLA Longevity Center, which is led by Dr. Linda Erkeley. Her skill sets are many, all embracing the mission of the Longevity Center, which is living better, longer. Since its founding, the center has primarily focused on strategies and techniques to boost brain health for those with normal and abnormal cognition. Dr. Erkeley is an Associate Clinical Professor in Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at the UCLA David Geffen Medical School's Semmel Institute. Her research and practice centers on neuroimaging and the neuropsychology of age-related cognitive disorders. For years, we at Belmont Village have been mining her groundbreaking research on lifestyle interventions to improve brain function. Through years of implementation, we know that when undertaken systematically, these healthy lifestyle interventions really work. I honestly can't think of anyone more qualified to speak on minding our memory, so it's truly an honor for me to introduce a great thinker, leader, researcher, clinician, and friend, Dr. Linda Erkeley. To you. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's my absolute pleasure to be here and to speak to your community and really be supportive of all the good work that you do because you do so much uh, through your community for improving the quality of life and uh, extending cognitive health for uh, your residents. So thank you. And welcome everyone and hola. Uh, and buenos dias to Mexico City as well, and to everyone um, calling in from all your various uh, locations and homes. 
And uh, yes, I'm very pleased to talk about minding our memory challenges and training techniques for brain health. So next slide, please. Thank you. So we're going to cover a few topics today, uh, talking about memory function in normal aging and abnormal aging and uh, the types of cognitive training exercises and interventions that have been uh, have been studied in, in research. Also, um, want to talk about what the research says about cognitive training and how it can be helpful. And we're going to actually dive a little bit deeper into the weeds and, and show you some research on what happens to the brain when people engage in cognitive training. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to talk first about memory functions in normal and what we call pathological or abnormal aging. And so this is a schematic of a healthy brain on, on the, the uh, what would be on your left. And, uh, and what happens to a brain as it as it becomes unhealthy and starts to shrink, which is called atrophy. And we're going to be talking mostly about the healthy part of the brain today. But what we're trying to do in, in the, uh, our interventions and also in leading healthy lifestyles is to really uh, avoid or at least stave off brain changes that are unhealthy in the brain. So we want to keep it looking like the healthy side of this schematic. Okay, and uh, let's move. Great, thank you. So let's first talk about what are some common memory complaints in aging? Is it uncommon to complain about one's memory as people age? And the answer is not at all. So just because you have memory complaints doesn't mean that you actually have to worry, but they do cause worry when people notice some problems that happen with aging. So for example, people might have trouble remembering to do something in the future, like make an appointment, right? Or go to an appointment. They might have trouble remembering what someone said. Um, it's very, very common to forget names uh, at least temporarily. So that name might be on the tip of one's tongue, but it might be hard to, to retrieve or bring up, but it usually comes back to you later. And in general, one of the most common complaints is finding the right word to say in conversation. So we call that the tip of the tongue uh, phenomena, and it's, it's very common, and usually what happens is People can't think of the word in the moment, but usually it comes to somebody later on. So these are some of the most common complaints in aging. Next slide, please. Now, what is normal aging? We talk about you know, what's normal, what's not normal. We seem to know when somebody has a real memory problem, but, but through the process of aging, it's hard to tell sometimes what's just normal changes with with age and what is something to worry about. And I, I like to think about brain health as, as a lot like joint health. So we all know that our knee at the age of 60 is not the same knee that we had at 20 or 25. And it's the same with the brain. So I think people get really worked up about, oh my God, you know, my brain's not the same anymore as when I was 20. And the answer to that is no, and it won't be, but that doesn't mean that you have a serious problem. So same thing with the knee. Maybe people that exercise or used to exercise know that when they were 20, they could leap tall buildings at a single bound. And when they're 50 and even 40, things change. So what is normal aging? It's not always clear though. And that's because the changes in aging are very gradual. And there is some overlap between what's normal aging and what's not normal aging. And when you get into that gray area, it's true. We can't always tell the difference until it progresses. So, but we do know that declines in cognitive function and in brain structure and in brain function occur, even in people without 
Alzheimer's disease signs and symptoms. So even people that what we call super agers, that they're, they're very high functioning into their you know, later life, even they have changes as they age. And so some of the changes that happen in the brain is our brain does shrink a little bit. Also, we get these little, um, what they call on MRI, white matter hyperintensities. These are bright spots in the brain that are small, and it, it's pretty normal in, in, in aging as well, especially after the age of 60. But it, it, if you get too much of that from having cerebral vascular disease, it can be a problem. But a little bit is pretty normal and not to worry about. And we know that what happens is that the changes in how our neurons or our brain cells work uh, may, may change over time with age. So we call that functional rearrangement, which is a fancy term for the brain really kicks in different networks and has to work harder with age to do the same task, right? So the brain has to work a little bit harder. But though that is all part and parcel to aging. Next slide, please. Great. So thank you. So here's a schematic of, of what happens to the brain in aging. So on the y axis, which is the vertical axis, that's cognitive functioning. So the arrow on that axis is pointing up, meaning higher on that uh, axis means better functioning. On the bottom, you have time. So time marches on as you go to the right, right? That's aging. So as you can see where it says normal on that curve, people start out high, right? Up there. And as you can see, it starts to gradually, the curve goes down and that's normal. But then there is a place that uh, might happen to some people called mild cognitive impairment. And this is when some people have cognitive challenges that are somewhere in between normal and in between dementia. So when I say dementia, I'm talking about Alzheimer's disease, or vascular dementia, or frontal temporal dementia. It's abnormal, right? So there is this gray area where sometimes it's hard to tell if that's going to stay, if that if those cognitive changes are going to stay where they are at mild cognitive impairment, if they might get better, or if they're going to get worse. So that's why it's sometimes difficult to tell. And this is where a lot of our research is focused now on if you have mild cognitive impairment, can we stop it? Is there a way we can turn back the clock? Or we just can't do anything about it, and we're going to treat people's symptoms as best as we can. Okay, next slide, please. So when we talk about changes that happen in aging, there, there is a certain vulnerability in the brain for certain types of functions to change with age, while others remain pretty solid for much of one's life. So let's talk about First of all, what stays solid? What is pretty resilient to aging? And that's old knowledge. So stuff that we learned in school, cultural knowledge, occupational knowledge, we call this crystallized intelligence because it's hard like a crystal, right? It, it's pretty resilient. It doesn't crack or break or wear down. And so factual information, who was Martin Luther King Jr.? Define words, read words, of information that we can think of as wisdom, as old knowledge and experience. That stays stable until like 170s and sometimes even later. And that, that does tend to decline too after the age of 70 but it stays solid for many, many years. Now, what is vulnerable to changes with age is new knowledge and mental speed. So we call this fluid intelligence. So what's that? Okay, new knowledge, like learning something new, like a new phone number, 
or taking a class and having to learn something new. How quickly we can think. Sometimes our abstract reasoning is not as, as good as it used to be. Our, we're not always as flexible. And, and this comes across in having problems with multitasking and doing more than one thing at a time, or sometimes finding alternatives when something doesn't work out, it takes you longer to think of, hey, what's plan B? And even mental calculations, we're not as sharp as we get older. But this happens earlier in life. Actually, our brain speed starts to decline pretty young. So we're in our prime when it comes to brain speed when we're in our 20s, if you can believe it. But nobody really notices the minor changes and maybe so they get into their, into their 40s. That's the first thing to change. And then memory starts to change in the 50s and 60s. Okay, next slide, please. Ah, yes. Okay, and I just wanted to say that everybody changes at a different rate. So this is very, very important to know this, that how quickly people's memory changes really depends on how well they take care of themselves. It takes about their lifestyle, some genetics involved. So it's not the same for everyone. Okay. So um, next we're gonna talk about cognitive enhancement training. And, oh, sorry, can you go one back please? And um, really the idea about how this all got started was the goal of these trainings, these cognitive enhancement or memory interventions is to support independent living and improve quality of life. So that's the main goal. That's why you do this. It's to compensate for problems and try to keep people sharp. So let's go to our next slide, please. Now you're gonna hear a few different terms about cognitive enhancement training. And there's a few different kinds. So one is what we call mnemonics. And these are memory focused techniques to help people remember for the future. And they usually involve forming associations or visual images to bolster memory and enhance one's attention and provide some kind of a reference point or cue to help you remember in the future. So these mnemonic techniques, which I'll talk about in a minute, are really for compensating for cognitive weaknesses. It's really to try to help the brain step up and, and kind of make do for age-related changes. And they work quite well for that purpose. Now there's another type of cognitive intervention. It's cognitive training for improving cognition, meaning you're not just compensating or offsetting problems, you're really trying to make changes in the brain to improve your, your mental functioning. And these typically are focused on the speed of brain processing, focused on reasoning, enhancing attention, and something which we call executive functioning, which really are just very high level brain functionings that involve speed, reasoning, things like that. And this type of training usually occurs on the computer. And it involves repeated and consistent practice with difficulty levels of your exercises going up as you get better at doing these exercises. So you may have heard of brain training programs like Lamosity, for example, and, and others that you, you sit on the computer and do, that's what those are. They're for improving cognition. Now, two other strategies that I'm not gonna talk about today, but are very important, is practical strategies for support. Post-it notes, for example, using alarms, using calendars. These are always good to include uh, to support memory. And, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about it, but the research on this shows like they're very helpful, but they're supportive. They're not necessarily gonna improve. They're not gonna change your functioning, 
but they're gonna help you manage and cope. And finally, there's what we call cognitive rehabilitation for people with brain injury. And these are typically, uh, not, not exclusively, but typically one-on-one -on -one customized uh, brain programs for folks that maybe have had a traumatic brain injury, like a head trauma, or for people that have had stroke. Okay, next slide, please. So what are important components of memory training? Well, first of all, it's to process information more deeply on a meaningful level. So instead of just trying to rotely remember something, it's about making that information personally meaningful and more relevant to you because that's how you remember it better. Okay, to increase your attentional focus, to help you have cues so that when you need to recall that information, you have help like hints already implanted in your brain. And these are usually involving mostly association and visual imagery. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about a few effective techniques and, and there's, um, these are readily available on the internet or Gary Small has written about them in his books. But we're gonna talk first about what's a good memory training technique. And, um, and there's a few. There, these are techniques for remembering uh, lists of items, and you can do this by forming stories, grouping like items together. Um, there are techniques to remember faces and names, and, and just in general learning how to form associations and, and really capitalizing on this to remember um, information. So, for example, if you see the picture uh, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that it's, it's an entryway with a, a carpet and you'll see some vases and you'll see pedestals with a few ferns. And one technique involves taking a, a list, for example, like this list, let's say you got to go to the store and you want to get coffee and bananas and you got to take your golf clubs in for servicing. And uh, you're going to form associations between those items on the list and, and objects in the room of your house. So the room of your house is used, and you can use every room in your house, and you can use several locations per room. So if you have like a five room house and you have three locations per room that you're using, you can remember 15 things. And just as a, an example, you're going to pair or make an image between objects in the house and, and what's on your list. So let's say that first object here is coffee. You got to get some coffee. So you might think about coffee spilled on the rug. So that, that number one in there on the, on the screen on that carpet means coffee gets associated with the rug and you visualize coffee, a cup of coffee, ruining your rug, for example. Then the second might be uh, looking at the vases that are by that window in the back. And you might think of bananas in those vases instead of flowers. So now you're forming an association with the second item on the list and the vase, bananas sticking in those vases. And if you want to enhance that image, you can think of big, bright bananas that are yellow, right? And finally, golf clubs, you pair them with, let's say, the ferns on the um, pedestal. And you might think of swinging a golf club and knocking the fern off the pedestal. So the trick here is to remember those three images, coffee spilled on the rug, bananas in the vase, and golf club swinging at the fern. And that's what you remember. So when you get to the store, you'll say, what's my images? Oh, wait a minute, coffee on the rug, bananas in the vase, the golf club was swinging at the fern and you decode it. I need coffee, bananas, and I have to take care of my golf clubs. So this is one of the most powerful techniques. It's been around since um, Roman times because the senators in Rome used this technique to help them remember their long speeches. 
So this is called the method of loci. Next slide, please. So your brain is set up to learn by association. That's normal, that's natural. This is what your brain loves to do. And there's a certain part of your brain that's the most important memory center of the brain called the hippocampus that does this. And so, for example, you have the word Frank in your brain, but look how many things Frank can be associated with. It can be associated with a hot dog, it can be associated with Frankfurt, Germany, or the meaning of Frank, right? Honest and truthful, or, you know, one of my favorites, Frank Sinatra. So you might have a cousin, Frank. So again, we're gonna make use of these connections. That's what these mnemonic techniques do to help you remember, for example, if you meet your neighbor, Frank, you can think of him eating a hot dog, or you might think he reminds you of Frank Sinatra, but this will help you remember his name the next time you see him. Next slide. And click one more time, please. There you go. So this is another great technique. It's called foreign stories with the story method where you remember lists. And let's say you have this list of several items that you need to remember. And so you just simply make up a story. And so we provide you with a little story here. It's a silly story, but it's super visualable or visualizable. And uh, the story doesn't have to make sense. In fact, if it doesn't make sense or makes you laugh or it makes you go, this is a weird story, but I really like can remember it. That's going to help you remember those items. So the idea is to remember the story, not the individual items. Remembering a story is like remembering one thing that all hangs together. And it's a lot easier because it has meaning than remembering, you know, eight or 10 or more items that aren't related and don't have a lot of meaning in them of themselves. Next slide, please. And click one more time. So let's say you have a new neighbor. Her name is Roseanne. How do you remember her? So this is the face name technique. And essentially what you do is you need to look at her face. So we so often don't look at people's faces when we meet them and look at what stands out, her eyes, her teeth, her smile, her cheekbones. And then you change the name to something meaningful. So Roseanne sounds like Rose. So then you would associate her name and her face using an image. So you may picture her with roses for her eyes, a rose in her hair, rosy cheeks. But the idea here is you're connecting her face, something on her face to her name. So that when you see her again, the idea is to remember the image, which will then uh, give you a hint or cue your memory for her name, Roseanne. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that was a, a, a quick tour of some mnemonic techniques that are used to compensate for brain changes. So now I'm going to talk just briefly about computerized cognitive training. And um, this is something that uh, you have to do repetitively, like five days a week practicing the research shows at least 20 minutes a day over a minimum of eight training sessions. And it's focused again on mental processing speed, visual search, concentration, and also executive functions. So keeping information in your head. And um, on this slide, you see the person at the computer, and this is a pretty typical setup. And you, these are things you can do where you live at home on the internet and um, at the bottom is an example of an exercise where you see there's a series of numbers right four one three seven eight seven five six five six okay so the numbers are going to be presented one at a time on your computer screen so first the four will show up, then that'll go off, and the one comes up, that'll go off. 
And they're presented pretty quickly, like, you know, less than a second, right, for the next one, or about a second. And um, what you're supposed to do is take note of them, and if the number on the screen is the same as the number, two numbers before it, then they want you to press the space bar and say, yes, I saw that before. Yes, I saw that two numbers ago. So in this case, you see that the 787, right, you would press the space bar where the star is and saying, yeah, there was a seven, two numbers before that. Then you go to the next number, it starts all over again. There's a five, you go, okay, five, then you see the six, then you see the five again. And you press the space bar again and says, yeah, I saw the five. And then that's followed by a six. And you're like, oh yeah, there was a six too. Now, this takes practice. This is not easy. But this is a very effective technique, one of the most effective techniques for improving how you can keep information in your head. And it, it's called the end back test. N as in number, because you have to remember a certain number back. So um, I probably just, your brain is probably smoking right now after after I told you that. But remember, you start out easy. You start out saying what was the number right before that, right before that. And once you get good at that, then you, you keep stretching it. Okay, what was the number two before that? So it's very challenging, but it's very much supported as being effective uh, by the research. And you can do this for free on the internet. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Next slide, please. So what does the research say? What are the best techniques? Um, does it help in daily life? Do these training techniques last? And who are the best candidates for this? So let's go to the next slide. And um, compared in, in studies that compare to people that get no training, right? They're just on a wait list. Um, most of the techniques seem to be effective. So face name recall, remembering um, word lists, method of loci, all those memory uh, mnemonic techniques seem to work not only on tests, but also people report that they remember better. Now, what seems to be the most responsive are the computerized training uh, for working memory, processing speed, and reasoning. Those seem to um, really have the strongest evidence saying, okay, th these seem to be most effective against weightless groups. Um, memory improvement does occur as well, but it's seen less consistently and, and especially if you have a control condition that is not just a wait list, but involves some kind of cognitive stimulation like uh, attending a, a, a health education class. And so this tells us that anything mentally stimulating may rival the benefits of some memory training. But I want to also emphasize that a lot of these studies use cognitive tests as their, um, as the way they measure the effects. And we get something called practice effect which means that the more you take a cognitive test, the more you practice that test, the better your memory gets. So it's not always, you, you, there's sometimes some noise in the system where it's hard to see the benefits of memory training because they, people get tested a lot and they just get better at the testing as they get tested again and again, which tells you that practice is good, right? Practice is good. So. I just want to uh, take that message home to you as well. Okay, next slide. The training gains can last at least two months, but really they last longer. A lot of, a lot of studies show that they might last six months. Um, the longest training gains in one study showed five years. And this was in a large uh, multi-site uh, study called the ACTIVE study, which you may have heard about where people got reasoning training, memory training, processing, processing speed training, 
And what they saw after five years was that the people who got the training five years ago were still doing better than the people who never got training at all. So it's not that they stay where they are, but the declines over the five years were not as steep as what the people who didn't get training experienced. So um, training may prevent the, the rapid rate of decline uh, over time in, in people who get the training versus people who don't, right? And what's really important though, is that you, you get booster sessions. So you just don't get it once and say, I'll never need it again, but, but refresher courses are really helpful. Next slide, please. Next question is, does training transfer to benefits in daily life? So training on a task, what we say transfer, training on a task results in improvements on a task that was not trained. So if I learn uh, to how to make stories to remember a list, will I be able to remember my grocery list better in daily life? That's the type of question. This isn't studied as much as it should be because it's kind of hard to do those studies. You have to really follow people in their daily life and measure what they're doing. But what we see is that training transfers or benefits or transfers the tasks out we're not trained that are new when you increase the difficulty of your practicing as you get good, you need repetitive training, right? So you need to practice 36 to 100 hours if you're doing computerized testing. You need to have different training experiences. So learn your license plate number, remember things at the store, learn a phone number, this kind of variable experience helps you apply it to daily life. And, um, and it does make sense that what you learn and what you're practicing and training on is like daily life, right? So if, if you're going to use a mnemonic device to remember a grocery list, that's a good thing to try to remember, right? It's better to remember something that's similar to what you're going to be doing in daily life than to try to learn it on something totally unrelated. And transfer is really important when it's taught. In other words, you have to tell people, I want you to practice this and now go out there and try to use it. And, and you, I'm going to give you a homework exercise to do something different and apply this technique to something other than the course. So people need to know you don't just learn this and it magically transfers right so but you want to um purposefully practice so you're going to use it in daily life next slide and who benefits from this training mostly people with age-related cognitive decline so people with dementia don't benefit because they're they're too ill their brain is too um too impaired to, to really be able to learn and apply this. Um, younger adults tend to show greater gains than older adults, but the research also, also shows that older adults who need to improve with more room for improvement may experience the greatest benefit. So that's really encouraging. People with a little more trouble, would they have more room to grow? Next slide, please. And the most effective trainings, again, computerized training for working memory and the mnemonics training, mostly any of those methods that I talked about today are uh, helpful for compensating for age-related cognitive decline. And a nonspecific brain stimulation is also good. In other words, keep active, have conversations, take courses, um, Get involved. If you're living in a residential community, you should get involved in the activities that are on the calendar. Don't stay in your room and watch TV all day. Okay, next slide. So now I'm going to show you some cool pictures of what the brain looks like when you're doing these um, activities. And, and uh, this is the last portion of, of the talk. So next slide, please. All right. 
How do you study brain changes as a result of cognitive training and mnemonics training? There's a few different ways. So the first one in the upper uh, left-hand corner is a picture of a, of a brain MRI. And that red line is basically they're drawing a giant region around the brain to measure the volume of the brain. So they're going to take measurements within that, excuse me, red, re red line around the brain. They're going to take measurements within that area and basically look at the volume of the brain. And um, you can do that with whole brain and also smaller regions to look at specific regions important to memory. On the right is a picture of, um, it's a picture of changes in blood flow that are superimposed on the map of the brain. And this is what we're looking at with functional MRI. This looks at the changes in blood flow in the, in the, at the neuronal level and network level, actually, that tells us something about neuronal functioning. And so you can see those red areas are areas that are um, marking change in those regions uh, associated with cognitive stimulation. And then at the bottom left is uh, a study of EEG or brain waves. And this is something that, that um, I did at UCLA with Andy Luchter and, and Patricia Gans. And uh, we were looking at the effects of cognitive training in people with cancer-related cognitive impairment, or you might know it as chemo brain or chemo fog. And so we see changes in the EEG, uh, which are brain waves, in, in this type of intervention. So there are numerous waves, ways to measure uh, how the brain changes, either in its structure or in its function. Next slide. So some evidence supports the positive effects of training on brain structure and function. There aren't enough studies looking at this, and they're, they're, a, they're kind of a lot of work to do, and they're quite expensive once you start getting brain imaging in there. But we're, you know, more and more are being, um, are being conducted. So for a small number of computerized cognitive training studies, we see that um, there are changes in, in brain volume. So you get, there in, let, in other words, the, the gray matter of the brain doesn't atrophy as much in people with cognitive training. We see um, changes in brain function. We see changes in the EEG. And what's really interesting is in, when you're looking at brain function, sometimes the function increases in the very beginning and then it decreases after that, the activity of the neuron. And what they think that is, is that first of all, your brain, when it's learning something new, it steps up and it engages more areas of, uh, and more brain networks. And then once you practice and get good at it and your brain basically gets used to it, then your, your brain networks relax and they don't have to work as hard. So what sometimes you see is an increase in brain activity followed by a decrease in brain activity, which basically says your brain works harder in the beginning to learn it. And then once it becomes efficient, it doesn't work as hard. Next slide. Uh, there was a study done where they, they pull the results of different studies with mild cognitive impairment. Remember, that's that intermediate stage between normal aging and dementia. And they gave them computerized uh, cognitive training. And then they under, underwent fMRI brain imaging. And this study showed that people had significant changes in the brain activation as a result of the cognitive training. And it suggested that this was happening in memory networks and, and appeared that the brain was compensating for its weaknesses. And actually some studies showed that the brain may have been more than compensating, but there may have been some possible restoration or restoring a brain function. So let's take a look at these studies. Next slide. Okay, so when we talk about compensation 
versus restoration. What do we mean? So bear with me, this gets a little pithy. When we talk about compensation, what we mean is that the brain seems to activate or turn on new areas that, that get involved, that step up to compensate for an inefficient brain. When we talk about restoration, we're talking about improvements in areas of the brain that are not functioning well. They're like, they're, they're below, below what you would expect. And, and so from before training to after training, the function of those brain areas improve, but it's not new areas coming into play. Next slide. So here is a picture of, um, we see the, the area with the red circle. That's an area uh, in what we call the parietal lobe of the brain that showed um, that people's uh, brain function actually stepped up, right? Uh, and became more active. And um, they also thought that the area, it was normal at baseline, right? It wasn't impaired, but basically there were additional areas being activated. And um, this was only happening in the people with MCI. So these, these new areas that seemed to step up, they thought, okay, this is an example of compensation. Next slide. Now here's a slide of the hippocampus. It's in this case, it's just that one region of the brain that has been isolated on this brain image. And this area actually showed improvement in functioning suggestive of restoration after cognitive training in people with mild cognitive impairment. So if you go to the far left, you see there's a lot of blue on that region of the brain. And it shows this is reduced hippocampal functioning uh, in people with mild cognitive impairment. Okay, it's reduced compared to healthy people. But then after they get training, the brain, this is in the second image, you see the orange, it means it's improved. So the area that was not functioning well before training is now improved in its functioning after training. And then if you look at the last slide, that's an untrained task. So that's a brand new task. And what you see here is even on a brand new task, that part of the brain is functioning better. The orange meaning it's, step, it's improved. So this is suggestive of restoration of functioning. Next slide, please. So what does this all mean? What can you do yourself at home to improve your brain functioning? Functioning. First of all, stay mentally stimulated. I definitely agree that these compen compensatory methods, the mnemonics, the association, the visual imagery, are what are what you can do and learn and use them. So it it is easy to learn and the research shows it can help you compensate. It's also important to learn new things. Your brain loves novelty. It's meant to learn new things. And so read, discuss what you read. Don't just keep it to yourself. Take a class, have conversations get involved in activities. Again, if you're a resident of, of Belmont, getting involved in the many activities are there that are there, that's what they're meant to do. If you don't live at Belmont, go to a senior center or take a class or do something, join a book club, but keep, keep the wheels turning right of the brain. Um, it's very important to socialize. So loneliness, in isolation are very bad for brain health and overall wellness and mental health. So again, if you're living in a community, that's, a, that's one of the reasons why people move to communities is to not be socially isolated. Uh, it's been very tough during the pandemic. 
So, um, you know, something you can do is use Zoom more. And, um, you know, as things open up, it would be great to start to reconnect. Definitely treat depression. Um, try to live a healthy lifestyle with exercise because exercise is, is um, very much supported by research findings that it is good for the brain. It's good for cognition and um, follow a heart healthy diet, limit alcohol and definitely don't smoke because all these things affect your brain health and the blood flow in the brain. Next slide. And uh, just as um, a, a plug, a shameless plug, um, if you're interested in learning, we have a senior scholars program at the Longevity Center where you can audit undergraduate UCLA courses online for now, but it used to be in person. You can choose from over 150 classes and the center also provides some um, add-ons like a book club and speakers if you get in, involved. So at, on that note, I believe it's, it's time to turn this back over to uh, Patricia. Okay, Linda. So much. Uh, we've got had a number of questions that have come in, yeah. but I want to um, ask one um, since you are both a clinician and a researcher and see a lot of people who either are experiencing memory decline or think they're experiencing memory decline. Um, have we gotten a hint yet for those who've survived COVID 19, particularly the elderly? on whether there are neurological effects that will, will or have precipitated memory decline? Yeah, um, we're, we're going to be embarking on some research at UCLA and I'm sure it's gonna happen in other, in other universities as well to really try to answer that question. But the short answer to that is that um, COVID-19 can affect the brain. It can directly affect the brain like the virus itself, or it can have more effects indirectly because it affects um, oxygenation, right? If you're low on oxygen and it, it also creates inflammation in the brain. And there's definitely an increase in neurological problems in, in some people that have COVID. So it's possible that some people who have had COVID have had what we call hypoxia, have suffered changes in the brain due to low oxygenation or due to inflammation or even some cerebral vascular changes. So this is, this is the concern. Certainly people that have had COVID um, describe problems while they're ill of confusion. We know that neurologists have, you know, ha have actually seen this in their checkups uh, confusion, um, cognitive problems, you can get delirious. But some people, what we call the long haul COVIDers, um, you know, people that had it, some people continue to have kind of fog and, and uh, attentional lapses for um, some months following their recovery. And I would assume the recommendations that you're making uh, for fostering brain health would work as well for them. Uh, we don't, you don't have the research, but you would recommend that. I, I would, and I would definitely recommend that uh, people pay a special attention to their, you know, their health problems that, uh, you know, might affect cerebral blood flow, right? So you definitely want to make sure that you're, you're, you're following your doctor's recommendations if you have, you know, cardiac risk, pulmonary risk, or, or stroke risk anyway, in your family. So um, let me switch gears. And as I was looking at that final slide of things that you recommend to do, um, and I was, of course, reflecting on my life, and I thought, you know, healthy lifestyle, exercise, learning new things, a lot of socialization. Um, what about, and the one thing I, I think I flunk on is stress. So can you talk about stress and its effect on cognition and also um, mitigants in that regard? Yeah. So we know that stress can have direct effects and indirect effects. So 
the studies, for example, in people with actual stress disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder have shown that there are changes in the hippocampus, which is memory center in the brain. Um, that maybe one of the one of the risk factors is that people who are under a lot of stress have a lot of cortisol uh, released in um, in their bodies, like at chronic levels, and so it can have a negative impact on the hippocampus. There, there's a lot of data uh, supporting now how the stress from prop, uh, poverty, racism can also result in um, uh, cognitive risk factors because these have uh, just chronic stress has pro, uh, risk factors for heart health, right? Hypertension, all these things that are associated with blood flow to the brain, right? Stroke risk, vas cerebral vascular disease. So, um, so trying to reduce stress is very important. I mean, prime example is hypertension, right? Which is a major stroke risk and heart attack risk. So if you're at risk for heart problems, you're at risk for brain problems too. They go together. So it's really important to mitigate is to try to find stress reduction, whether it be through exercise, through um, people, a lot of people like mindful meditation. Uh, it, it's a form of, of kind of relaxation it's not, you know, it's a religion, so it doesn't like, you know, compete with people's religious beliefs. Um, and it really results in lowering uh, the breathing rate, deeper breathing, reduced blood pressure. So socializing, being around people, right? And even, you know, I, I'm a big supporter of psychotherapy. If there's something in your life that's going on that is creating a lot of stress and what you're trying to do is not working to reduce it, then definitely go get individual help. Thank you. We've had a number of requests for particular computer programs um, for um, taxing the brain, uh, some of which you described. Are there any specific programs that you like or even more so that you use? Um, I think ones that that I like, I like the NBAC test. I've I've used the NBAC, and I'll just go on and find a free NBAC and and try to work with with that. Um, there's Lumosity, uh, dot com, which a lot of people have um, have heard uh, about. That um, that has been. Uh, studied for a number of like disorders that might work. Um, it's studied in chemo brain. Uh, it's studied in normal aging. Um, but I think that's a great, a great program. And I think a lot of these you just sign up for, for like on a monthly basis. Um, right now though, it's, um, the name is uh, slipping my memory. So there you go. I'm having a typical <laughs> moment. But there's a program that was based up um, at, at UCSF that is based in research and was um, developed by uh, brain scientists. And uh, that also is along the lines of Lumosity. That could, that's also fairly well supported in research. Again, none, none of these studies are really studied broadly enough and in larger samples, right? But but I think it's important that one thing is for sure, you will get better on doing those exercises if you practice them. You'll get faster. You'll get more agile cognitively. What they're still working on more is to find out how much that's going to translate. Right? This is where the research needs to go where it's not as um it just more needs to be done so um it, we're about to wrap up but i've got to uh, just bob you one more question um and uh we all and hear a lot of, about um all kinds of diets um are there as a, as a clinician especially are there any diets you recommend for fostering brain health 
and further, um, I'm going to ask you this one more time. Does it correlate to what you eat with respect to brain health? Yeah, I really, I personally, I follow a brain health diet. I really believe in it. And um, actually, actually, I've been doing it for a long time because heart disease runs in my family. So uh, before it was a rage or rave, whatever, I had to learn about it when I was a kid because my people in my family suffer from heart disease. But basically, you're looking at low fat, um, you know, reduced red meat, um, uh, low alcohol, you know, moderation of alcohol, definitely. Um, you know, I don't do fast food, so watch your sodium intake, watch your fat intake. One of, one of the recommendations is the Mediterranean diet because it's it's high in uh, you know omega three fatty acids, which are antioxidants. Fish oil, um, eating a lot of fish, and you can get your antioxidants from your diet. Uh, if if you have a lot of green leafy diet, um, you know, in certain fruits like blueberries that. Um, so yeah, Mediterranean diet, low in fat, um, olive oil, things like that, right? No lard, no butter. Yeah, it's tough. Um, the other thing is there are plenty of diets out there for, you know, if you have kidney problems, if you have arthritis, then those diets are going to are going to change a little bit, right? And be tweaked. Um, if you have incontinence, um, there are things to do to uh, reduce that problem. Uh, uh, at least urinary incontinence. So yeah, it's well worth, well worth looking at your dietary, uh, you know, keeping um, keeping a log of what you eat and and either speaking to your doctor. I mean, I always recommend that, or a nutritionist um, about what really is a healthy diet for the individual based on their health risks. Okay. Um, listening to you, Linda, uh, I always feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose. Extremely I'm sorry. Grateful. No, I mean, you've got so much great information. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, um, this, will, this whole uh, session was recorded and we will make it um, available online at belmontvillage.com and also be able to send it to any of you who are participants. Um, I'm going to turn it back now uh, to Lauren, um, who can introduce Susan Berger. I cannot thank you all enough, and especially you, Dr. Linda Erkeley at the My pleasure. Longevity Center. Thanks. Thank you for all you do for all of your residents and for the community at large. And thank you so much, both Linda and Patricia, for um, you know going through an amazing session. Um, and Patricia for moderating and getting through some of the, the amazing questions that we got from the audience. Um, we really appreciate that everyone attended today and we certainly are continuing our webinar series going forward. So uh, keep an eye out for future invites. We'd love to have you. Um, now that you've attended our event today, we'd love to tell you a little bit more about Belmont Village. Uh, we're an amazing senior living company. I'm very proud to work here, but I'm very excited to turn it over to Susan, who has been with the company much longer than I have and can tell you everything about us. So with no further ado, Susan, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric Lee, for your amazing presentation. For 24 years, Belmont Village has owned and operated best-in-class, fully licensed senior living communities and were founded on the belief that all seniors deserve to live happy, self-directed lives in a supportive community filled with new friendships and interests, safety and security, quality and value, and above all, a place that they can call home. As Dr. Eric Lee suggested, Belmont also recognizes that lifestyle has a profound impact on one's brain health. What you eat and drink, how much you exercise, and the way you socialize are all critically important to that brain health. And just as our name suggests, our villages focus on bringing people together while providing them with a better quality of life. As we offer independent, assisted, and memory care support, 
And although our residents' needs may vary, everyone can count on our caring and compassionate staff committed to providing high quality person-centered care. And our residents and family have peace of mind knowing that our Belmont Village nurses, our trained medical professionals are on site 24 hours a day to serve the healthcare needs of each resident. And for those experiencing cognitive impairment and early stage memory loss, Belmont Village provides a therapeutic whole brain fitness lifestyle, one that combines our exceptional wellness model with mental fitness. This is an innovative approach to memory care and we call it our circle of friends. And with the circle of friends, we have changed how providers and their families think about assisted living and memory care support today. The goal of all of our memory care programs, whether mild or more advanced, is to provide our residents with the just right challenge every day so that they can feel successful and have a newfound sense of purpose. And at Belmont, we strive to create a positive experience for all of our members. Those members include our residents, our families, and our employees. And we continue to set new standards year after year in resident and family satisfaction. We've also been recognized as a great place to work and named to Fortune Magazine's top 50 best workplaces for aging services by our over 4,000 employees nationwide. If you have any questions about a Belmont Village near you, or you would like to learn more about Belmont's innovative approach to memory care, I hope that you will give me a call or send me a text or email. My name is Susan Berger, and I am a trusted family advisor. My phone number is 424-232-0704, and my email is sberger at belmontvillage.com. It is always my pleasure to assist families as they navigate the many options in memory care and senior living either for themselves or for their loved ones. Please take the time to compare and do not wait for a crisis to react. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Patricia and Dr. Eric Lee. And I look forward to seeing all of you at our next event. Bye-bye.